Hello, and welcome to episode three in my Piano 2 Orchestra series. Today, I'll take a look at my process for arranging a melody. That means coming up with chords, an accompaniment, maybe even a counter melody, and then turning just a few staves of music into a full orchestral version. I'll use a melody that I featured in my last few videos on articulations. It's a rather generic melody in a major key, and I'll try to keep the harmonic choices relatively simple. Before I get started, I just want to mention that you can get all of the MIDI files, music XML files, audio stems, Dorico, and Cubase files for this video by subscribing to my Patreon page. The link is in the description box below. And a big thanks to all of my current patrons for their support. It really means a lot. Here's the melody as it stands now. When I was writing this melody, I had chords in mind, but I'll pretend for a moment that I didn't. Here's one method for coming up with some harmonies. I need to decide on the following things. What is the harmonic language and style? That could be diatonic, modal, quintal, or chordal, or maybe chromatic. I might want to include jazz chords, or borrowed chords from another diatonic collection, or secondary dominant chords, or something else entirely. I like to get an idea of the kinds of chords that I'll use, otherwise the choices can be overwhelming. Secondly, what is the harmonic pacing? How often should the harmony change? You could conceivably have just one chord throughout the entire melody, or you could have the harmony change every eighth note. More likely, it's somewhere in between, and it doesn't have to change at a regular interval. Oftentimes, the harmonic pace will increase as the melody progresses. And lastly, what is the relationship between melody note and harmony? Are the melody notes a part of the chord, or are they non-chord tones? Let's look at the collection of pitches that make up this melody. As it turns out, this melody features a diatonic collection of all of the white notes, so no sharps or flats. That means that if we're in a major key, we're likely in C major. If we're in a minor key, we're likely in A minor. We could also choose one of the other modes using that same diatonic collection. Of course, just because the melody uses this collection, it doesn't mean the harmonic content has to stick to that collection. But to keep things simple for today, I think that's what I'll do. Normally, I wouldn't restrict myself quite like this, but I'll try to stick to triads and perhaps seventh chords built from this collection of diatonic pitches. That means that the following chords are options. Next, I have to decide on harmonic pacing. What does it sound like if I have just one chord throughout the entire nine measures? I will add a very basic left-hand accompaniment using a C major triad over the first four measures to get a sense of how that would sound. It really doesn't work, at least for my tastes, and it has to do with which notes are emphasized, either through metrically stressed beats or through duration. Downbeats are always going to be more structurally important, as are longer notes, in this case dotted quarters and half notes. So the downbeat A here is the sixth scale degree in C, and unless I'm stylistically going for a particular genre, uh, perhaps older jazz or popular music, this doesn't work for me. The F later on also clashes with the C major chord, so I'd maybe have to make that a suspended chord. Ultimately, this tells me that if I want the melody and harmony to be in C major, I may need to have several different chords that change depending on the downbeat melody note. I'll try the same thing in A minor, just one chord the whole time. I think this works a little better than the C major chord, still an issue here with the F in the melody, so I don't think one chord will work. So now I have to decide how often to change chords. I could stick with either the C major chord or A minor chord and only change when there's a clash. Or I could look at each measure individually and decide if there's a chord that works well for the entire measure. Let me try that. Here are some options for triads for each downbeat. Chords where the melody is either the third, root, or fifth of the chord. I'm not going to demonstrate every possible combination, that would take way too long. I might just try to lock in the first couple of measures though. Here are the first two measures, using A minor and measure one, and trying each of the three measure two chords. I'll 
try the same thing, starting with F major in the first measure. One of those options might stand out to you. For me, I like starting on A minor and moving to E minor in the second chord. I also liked starting on F major and moving to C major. It's really all about personal preference, and I'm not about to tell you that one is better than the other. It really depends on what your goal is. So I'd want to go through measure by measure and decide where and when to make harmonic changes. If a particular harmony works for part of the measure, but not all, then you might consider changing chords more frequently. Here's an attempt at a progression, with the first chord in A minor. I've improvised a simple accompaniment in the left hand. I've made one or two slight changes to the melody. For instance, I removed a beat right around here. I wanted more forward motion at that moment. Sometimes as you try different chords, you'll find that you want to make a few subtle rhythmic or metric changes to better fit the chords. I've labeled major and minor triads here, although I improvised in a few additional notes in the left hand. Instead of a D minor chord, I could label this as a D minor 7, and this last chord as an A minor 7. Once I establish the triads, I like to try adding different extensions like 7ths and 9ths. They won't always work, but they can make your harmonies richer. So here's what this version sounds like. Once I find the chords that I like, I will usually then explore inversions of those chords. There are a few ways to think about this. First, you could go through one chord at a time and try all of the inversions and see which ones sound best. What matters is the relationship of the bottom voice to the melody note. So for instance, it doesn't really make sense to change the E minor chord in measure 2 to a first inversion chord since G is already in the melody. I'd rather maintain the interval of a third between the E and the G. So the other way to think about inversions is in terms of bass motion. If you start changing which notes of the chord are in the lowest voice, then you can start creating a more interesting contour, almost like a counter melody. For instance, I might make the following choices about inversions so that the bass voice has ascending stepwise motion. I might choose this if I wanted to create a sense of anticipation or if we're pointing towards something in the music ahead. I'm not sure that it improves the music at all, so I'll mostly stick with root chords, perhaps with the exception of this moment here. I might see how the F major chord would sound in first version, considering the A chord is just after. It might be a nice moment to keep the bass voice the same. So for this video, I'd like to take this minor version and orchestrate it several different times, varying and adding a few things each time. I won't compose any more of the piece, I'll just focus on these eight measures. And I'll sort of ignore the left hand part that I came up with, so really all I have to work from is a melody and chords. I haven't indicated a tempo, so perhaps it would be interesting to try a few different tempos. I also want to think about musical style. Do I want this to be slow, lyrical, dense texture, or do I want something slightly quicker, perhaps lighter in texture? It can really help to have a sense of all these things beforehand. It will make orchestrating much easier. I'll first make a version with a slow tempo and a darker timbre overall. There's no reason I have to stick to this transposition, and I've said it many times before in previous videos, I often like to transpose piano music a few semitones up before orchestrating as lower voiced chords in the piano have a tendency to sound muddier when orchestrated at that same transposition. This is personal preference, and you could certainly make it work in A minor. But just because I can, I'll bump everything up a whole step. Now I'm in B minor. You'll notice that this melody spans quite a large range, two octaves in fact. That means that choosing an instrument that stylistically fits this melody and can play all of the notes in range 
is difficult. If I were to keep the melody in this octave, I might choose from the following instruments. Violins, violas, clarinets, maybe English horn, probably not oboe because of the low B, maybe trumpet, although I might want to take the last four notes down the octave, and that's probably it. If I want more of a dramatic, emotional, expressive timbre, I think either violins, clarinets, English horn, or a combination of violins and one of those woodwinds would be most effective. Let's say I wanted first violins and English horn together. I like the English horn here over the oboe because of the low register of the first few measures. But the last four notes are a bit high for English horn, not impossible, but it might be more effective if at that point I switch to oboe. Because they're in the same family of instruments, switching from one to the other for registral purposes can sound fairly seamless. I may also want to bring in oboe on the previous phrase, as the melody is increasing in dynamics. I'm sticking to just one octave of the melody, so I'll actually remove English horn from this last measure entirely. Let's hear what this sounds like. Before adding any other instruments to this melody, I want to try building a texture around what I have. A few things to think about. Density, color, and motion. How dense of a background texture do I want? I don't want to overpower the melody, but I also need to support it with enough instruments. Next, what colors or timbres do I want for the background texture? You might try identifying words like dark or warm or brassy or reedy or hollow or cold, things like that. Let's say I want a cold, hollow sound. Well, then I might want clarinets, flutes, maybe high strings without much vibrato, perhaps even string harmonics. Here's what it sounds like if I have sustaining flutes and clarinets, plus bassoons later on in the background. add the rest of the string section playing sustained harmonics. I'm showing the sounding pitch here in the notation, which isn't the proper way of notating harmonics, but it's a bit easier to read. At some point I may make a video on writing and notating string harmonics. I think the string harmonics plus the flutes and clarinets create a really effective cold and hollow sound. Let's give this a listen. It's starting to sound like a complete texture, but I think I'll see what else I can add. In terms of brass, I don't really want trumpets or low brass involved in this. Tamberly, I think that would be going in a different direction. I could see horns working, but I don't really need them. I want to keep this texture fairly thin. Instead, I'll add in a few percussion instruments that will fit in nicely with what I already have. I'll add bowed cratales and vibraphone, as well as a single soft timpani note in the last measure. Bowed crotales fit nicely with the cold, static string harmonics. And the soft vibraphone chords also have a cold, hollow texture. Thank you. 
So thinking again about density, color, and motion, this version was relatively thin with cold timbres and very little motion. I'll see if I can keep the density and timbre roughly the same, but add some more motion. I can add motion several ways. I could increase the rhythmic activity of the accompaniment. I'll do that in the flutes. I really like three flutes moving in eighth notes together. The register is a bit low for the third flute, so I've switched that to alto flute. I've kept the clarinets mostly static, added in a bass clarinet, and the two bassoons again. I suppose I could have all of the winds on moving eighths, but I didn't want to overdo it. Let's hear the winds alone here, minus the oboes. The second way I added motion was by changing the string harmonic sustains to harmonic tremolos. I've bulked up the harmonies a bit, so now the violin twos and violas have Divisi harmonic tremolos. And lastly, instead of crotales and vibraphone, I decided to add an eighth note harp part that shares similar notes and rhythms to the flutes. I have timpani once again on the last note, and I've also added a soft suspended cymbal note towards the end. This version is very similar overall, a lot of the same timbres, and it's similar in terms of density and weight. The textural motion, however, makes this version stand out a bit from the previous one. Let me try something similar. I'll create background motion through flute and clarinet trills. These trills range from half-step trills to trills of a fourth in interval size. The majority of the notes of these trills are chord tones, but occasionally I have the second or seventh scale degree present. Underneath the trilled winds, I have bassoons sustaining on lower harmony notes, and the bass clarinet enters towards the end below the bassoons in register. I decided to expand the register downward in this orchestration, so the timbre starts relatively cold and warms up towards the end. Let's hear just the woodwinds without the English horn and oboe on the melody. can also help to warm up a texture, so I've added in sustaining four-part horn chords in the mid-low register. I also have the tuba enter towards the end, doubling the bass clarinet part. Here's what the woodwind backgrounds plus brass sound like together. strings, I've switched from harmonic tremolos to saltasto tremolos. I'm trying to ever so slightly warm up this texture 
and Sol Tostos will help with that. I maintain a similar amount of motion via the tremolo articulation. Here's now wind, brass, and string backgrounds together. Lastly, in the percussion section, I've added some vibraphone chords, as well as a few triangle and suspended cymbal notes. I've also written an arpeggiated high piano part that adds a bit of motion and shimmer to the texture. Let's hear just the percussion section plus piano. So let's listen to this version with all of the instruments present. Earlier in this video, I at one point had an eighth note left hand part in the piano. I ignored that part for the first few orchestrations, but let me return to that now. As it is here, the left hand is for the most part simply outlining the triad of the chord using decent note spacing for the register. However, it interferes a bit with the melody right here, here, and here. I don't want the low voice accompaniment to get in the way of the melody, so unless I transpose the melody up the octave, I may want to adjust how the accompaniment interacts with the melody when it occupies a similar register. So I think I can make this left hand part a bit more effective. Instead of sustaining the end of each measure in the accompaniment, I've made the texture lighter by sticking with eighth notes. I also managed to get out of the way of the melody and even have some interesting counterpoint between the two parts. In this measure, I've sort of ignored the overall harmony and I focus on the interaction between the lines. Instead of making sure each accompaniment note fits within an A minor chord, I let the accompaniment line respond to the melody using interesting voice leading. Let's hear what this sounds like in piano and then I'll orchestrate this version. With a lighter accompaniment featuring a steady eighth note pulse, I think pizzicato strings would be effective. There are a couple of ways to distribute these notes, but I think that perhaps the most effective way would be to have one instrument, probably the cello because of the register, carry most of the line, with the other strings punctuating certain moments with harmony notes. Here are the first four measures in strings. I've transposed down a second, not really because of the strings, but because of the instruments that have the melody. I'll discuss that more in just a bit. So basses have just the downbeats, and I'm careful not to get too low with basses, as I'm going for a clear, light texture. Violas and both violin sections have notes above the cello, mostly harmonizing the second beat of the measure with a chord. The goal here is light and bouncy, so I don't want any of the parts to be too busy. Let's hear these four measures. last four measures, I wanted there to be a clear, tambral, and textural shift. 
possibly more activity and a busier accompaniment to contrast with the beginning. I divide the left-hand piano notes between celli and violas, with basses once again punctuating the root notes. In violins, I decided to try an articulation in Berlin strings called pizzicato tremolo. Unfortunately, the patch is only in the first violins, so I'm pretending that both violins have that texture here. The specific sound of the patch is quasi guitarra, like strumming the guitar somewhat uncoordinated between the players of the section. If you're writing for live players, you might consider writing in the score either quasi guitarra or uncoordinated, something like that. So you get a bit of randomness in the overall sound. In the second to last measure, I have these strings all come together on the accompaniment in octaves at a stronger dynamic before the octave G on the final downbeat. Let's hear these four measures in strings. With strings on the accompaniment, I think using woodwinds on the melody would work well. The string pizzicatos would probably get covered up if I used brass on the melody, but with woodwinds I can not only get a lighter sound than brass, I can shift the melody upward in register as well. I have three flutes and two oboes on the upper octave, and two clarinets and two bassoons on the melody in octave lower. There are times when this melody gets really high for bassoons, and that's the main reason for transposing down a second. I could have transposed down even more, but then I would have run into issues with notes out of range in low violins, as well as a dark timbre in oboes. It's really a delicate balance, making sure the instruments sit properly in their ranges. In the fifth full measure, I move the bassoons down, almost doubling the low string pizzicatos. I also bring in contrabassoon for added low wind warmth, and I bring in English horn at that point as well on the melody. As the melody gets higher, the flutes start to move into a fairly powerful part of the register, so it's better at this point to reinforce the low registers. Lastly, I decided to add a simple harmonization to the last four notes so that I emphasize the root and fifth of the G minor chord. Let's hear the woodwinds alone. So putting this all together, strings and woodwinds, here's what it sounds like. I'd like to explore one more concept with this melody. Here we have the piano version once again, this time in G minor, the key of the last orchestration. I'd like to add a counter melody, or some kind of middle ground melodic line that will sit nicely against what I already have. I have a melody and a background accompaniment, so there might be room for a middle ground counter line. Although this depends entirely on a few things. Most importantly, if your melody is continuously very active, there might not be any sonic space for a secondary melody. Especially if it's the first time we're hearing that melody in the piece, the last thing we want to do is distract the listener from that main melody. We just want to complement and support it. In this melody, I think there is just enough room for a secondary melody to exist, specifically in these moments. When the main melody finishes a phrase with either a rest or a longer duration note, it leaves space in the texture for something else to happen without it interfering with the main melody. Of course, in these moments, the left-hand piano part has moving eighths, so I suppose I could emphasize these notes in the left hand during these moments, perhaps by adding additional instruments or increasing dynamics. Instead, however, I'll keep the left-hand part as background material and add in a new middle ground counterline in those moments. So you'll notice that one of the most obvious features of this counterline is that it registrally is placed much higher than the main melody which helps to separate these lines into two distinct ideas. You'll also notice that the contour and shape of the line in a way responds to the main melody, 
almost like a call and response. The main melody features a large ascending pattern and the counterline is mostly moving downward. Rhythmically, the counterline stands out as it features mostly triplet rhythms against eighth notes in the melody. Here's what it sounds like all three parts on piano. So I'll orchestrate this version with the new counterline. There are so many ways that I could potentially orchestrate this, but for the sake of time, I'll just make one more version. I want to look specifically at the first phrase of the counter material. I'll demonstrate a cascading effect in the woodwinds, where the individual winds enter one after the other and each one sustains the last note, almost like a blurring effect. Here's how I went about this, using three flutes and two oboes. Because I was working with five instruments and three unique parts, I decided that the flute one part could be alone on the high C, and it would be strong enough in that range. The other parts are doubled, flute two with oboe one and flute three with oboe two, just to get a nice blend in timbre. Of course, you also want to make sure that the sustaining notes won't clash with the overall harmony. In my case, the C, the A, and the D fit nicely over the D minor chord, with the C being the minor seventh scale degree. So here's what this sounds like. I repeat this concept in measure four, and I add in some background sustaining long notes in measures one and three. Here are all of the woodwinds in the first four measures with clarinets on the melody, first bassoon on the eighth notes below the melody, and second bassoon on low sustains. To the rest of the orchestra, I have violins complementing the new counterline with high register quarter notes in measure two, then adding in the triplets in measure four. The violas are with clarinets on the melody and celli are doubling the bassoons below. Basses are essentially the same as they were in the last version, just pizzicato downbeats. I also added in horn sustains in the background that help support the harmony and make the overall texture a bit richer and warmer. Let's hear strings and brass for these four measures. So let's look at the entire eight measures now. Apologies for how small everything is with the full score. Even when I condense the winds and brass a bit in Dorico, it's difficult to get everything on the page. But here's the full orchestration. You can see I've added harp playing a similar line to the bassoons, as well as vibraphone complementing the counterline. I've also added suspended cymbal hits and a bass drum note at the end. In the last four measures, I added more low brass to help thicken the texture as the overall dynamics increase. In this version, I really exaggerate the crescendo leading into measure seven. Overall, this version is definitely a bit more complicated than the last, but still there's really only three things happening at any one time, a main melody, a secondary moving line, or background sustains. I'll switch over to looking at the MIDI now to listen to this version in its entirety. So that should do it for this one. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Remember you can get all of the MIDI files, music XML files, Dorico file, audio stems, Cubase file, all on my Patreon page. The link is in the description box below. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.